Hello again, everyone. Welcome to Washington Gun Law TV. I am Washington Gun Law President William Kirk. Thanks for joining us. Hey, listen, for those of you who've been geeking out on the channel here, you know that we have seen state legislature after state legislature after state legislature willfully ignore the holdings of the United States Supreme Court, willfully ignore the Second Amendment, and go ahead and pass restrictive and unconstitutional gun control legislation anyways. It has many of us wondering, so are they sociopathic or are they psychopathic? And I think I may have an answer because they're beginning to show more and more of their cards and what we're beginning to see is rather alarming. So we're going to take a real life example to show you just how desperate the those on the gun control left have become and how they are in fact in many ways losing their mind so today let's spend a few minutes and talk about when the gun control community gets so deranged they detach themselves from reality Okay, before we get going down the road, we're going down. Proud to announce that this video is being brought to you by Legal Heat. That's right, the nation's largest educator of concealed carry classes. Legal Heat has now taught over 200,000 people nationwide since they started doing this in 2005. Now listen, for the hometown crowd here in Washington State, you can find a class at any one of these locations right here. If you're living outside the state of Washington, congratulations, there's a good chance that you're living much freer than we are, unless of course you live in California, Oregon, Illinois, Michigan, New Jersey, or New York. However, even if you live in one of those states or any state, you can find a class near your backyard by visiting them at mylegalheat.com. That's my legal heat. And now listen, if you find a class and you like it, go ahead and sign up. Use the promo code Washington Gun Law. That's Washington Gun Law, all one word, and you will receive 10% off. So for more information, visit my good friends at mylegalheat.com. Okay, so the case we're talking about today is a case called Rupp v. Bonta. What the hell is Rupp v. Bonta, you say? Well, that is a case that is challenging, one of the many challenges, I should say, to California's assault weapons ban. Now, before we get too far down the road, I want to thank Costas Moros, an attorney in California. Follow him on Twitter. He's fantastic. Right there, follow him on Twitter. This guy is given up-to-the-minute play-by-play of every type of gun control and Second Amendment litigation going on around the country. Um, I get a lot of my information from him so kudos to mr moros you do a fantastic job all right so the case is a case called rup v bonta it was a case that challenges california's assault weapon ban and for those of you who still live free like americans just so you understand when an assault weapon ban comes your way okay what's going to happen is is they're going to start listing any semi-automatic centerfire rifle with any of the following components and then they're just going to list all the components that you're going to find on your typical ar and ak platforms pistol grips barrel shrouds um, and so on and so on you know muzzle devices anything you name it it's going to be listed and then of course if the firearm has any more than one of those components it's deemed automatically an unlawful assault weapon now this uh, case, Rupp v. Bonta, was ricocheting on around up towards the Supreme Court, and along came New York Pistol and Rifle Association Ray Bruin. And that, as we know, GVR'd a lot of these cases, and some of them directly and indirectly, back on down to the district court levels, where the courts are going to now conduct further findings and make rulings consistent with Bruin. So now we are at a point where the state of California now wants to establish or needs to establish more historical significance as to why all of these regulations and laws and restrictions that they have are constitutionally necessary, permissible, and necessary to pr protect the safety. And so what they have done is and they have uh, employed a retired United States Marine Corps colonel, Colonel Craig Tucker, um, who according to his resume has an incredibly decorated uh, military career he has served his country proudly he has served his country valiantly he is a decorated combat veteran and i did not personally serve in the united states military so i will never make any comment about anybody who has served other than thank you for your service to our country um and while i think that colonel tucker has an amazing well decorated uh military career uh, I'm questioning how well the colonel is attached to reality. Now, why do I say this? Okay. Well, I say this because this is what the colonel testified in describing all of the components and the dangers of the AR platform. 
Uh, what he did is he kind of grouped everything into the fact that everything has to be chambered in a 223 or 556. Five, everything is going to be in rifle caliber. And that really the only difference between our guns and the guns they used in the military is that one extra little setting for automatic fire. Now, What's gotten everyone in the 2A community a little worked up, kind of got all of our eyebrows raised, is the following testimony that the colonel gave, and I will remind you that this was given under penalty of perjury. The AR-15 and M4 are both designed to fire a 223 round that tumbles upon hitting flesh and rips through the human body. A single round is capable of severing the upper body from the lower body or decapitation. The round is designed to kill, not wound, and both the AR-15 and the M4 contain barrel rifling to make the round tumble upon impact and cause more severe injury. The combination of automatic rifle and the 223 round is a very efficient killing system. The same can be said of the AR-15. That's his words, not mine, okay? And so, unbeknownst to me, because I do own several firearms in this platform, I was not aware that essentially a 22 bullet going at roughly 3,300, 3,400 feet per second, packing all somewhere between 50 and 60 grains, um, is capable of cutting a human body in half. But according to the good colonel, that is exactly what uh, can occur here. Now, he goes through additional components. He basically goes through every component of a typical AR platform rifle and explains why the state of California is justified in doing, in banning it. And what he essentially says is, is listen, the more efficient the user is with the firearm, translation, the safer that a person is with the firearm because they are more accurate with the firearm, the more efficient of a killing machine it gets. And for that reason, we need to ban this because we need firearms that people will be horribly inefficient and unproficient with and not particularly accurate with. Take, for example, detachable magazines. What does the good colonel say about detachable magazines? During intense combat, the detachable magazine provides a rifleman the capability to fire 120 rounds on semi-automatic in three minutes at a high sustained rate of 45 rounds per minute. In a civilian self-defense context, by contrast, an individual would not have a need for such a high rate of fire. Okay, and then what does the colonel say about the pistol grip? Well, he says this. Absent any pistol grip, a semi-automatic rifle would be difficult to operate when fired rapidly, as the rifle barrel would seesaw up and down with each shot fired in succession. Second, the pistol grip functions as a hand rest to reduce hand finger fatigue during long combat engagements. Both actions increase the killing efficiency of automatic rifles and are necessities in sustained combat operations of weeks or months when firing a rifle rapidly. And I'll take his word for that as to what combat is when you're firing on full auto all the time, but I'm still looking for something here that says anything other than it makes a shooter safer to use the firearm. Now, how does he talk about foregrips, forward pistol grips, whatever you want to call them? Well, he says this, the forward pistol grip provides leverage to tighten a stock weld on a short barrel automatic weapons and reduces recoil and barrel rise on short barrel automatic rifles. Forward pistol grips were added to the M4 to increase M4 killing efficiency. Okay. And again, I'm still trying to figure out what we're trying to connect the dots. Now, this is the guy who says that a 223 round can cut a human being in half. But again, what he's getting at is it makes a person more proficient, more efficient, and safer with the use of that firearm. Flash suppressors, muzzle brakes, any of that. What's the colonel say about that? He says this. This accessory serves specific combat-oriented purposes and is not needed for self-defense. Detachable magazines that hold more than 10 rounds. What does the colonel have to say? As noted above, in connection with detachable magazines, an individual using a rifle in self-defense would not need such a high continuous rate of fire. And then to just put a little icing on top and a little cherry, this is how the colonel describes his use of different platforms during his military service and then tries to equate that with why California should be able to ban the most popular rifle known to man on the planet. The colonel states, the AR-15 is an offensive combat weapon no different in function or purpose than an M4. 
In my opinion, both weapons are designed to kill as many people as possible, as efficiently as possible, and serve no legitimate sporting or self-defense purpose. However, wouldn't efficient killing probably be the best way to defend yourself? But I digress. The colonel also states, Self-defense and military combat are different. The weapons and accessories needed in one may not be needed or appropriate in the other. For instance, when I was serving in the military, I carried my M4 for offensive combat and a handgun for self-defense. Well, you can imagine that this testimony not only raised a lot of eyebrows in the legal community and the 2A community, but it also had plaintiff's counsel decide, well, maybe we ought to go get our own expert, too. And they did. They went out and they hired an expert. Now, I should point out that the colonel was getting paid $200 an hour. And uh, candidly, I think the state's getting ripped off on that one. But that's my opinion. Um, the defense expert, may, being paid $700 an hour, a better businessman, that is Jay Buford Boone who has an extensive law enforcement experience, including being the expert for the FBI on firearms and a trainer for the FBI on firearms, and probably as well-versed in every platform of firearm known to man, has qualified as an expert in literally every state in the country about firearms-related issues. And how does he begin his testimony? Well, he begins it like this. It is my opinion that Colonel Tucker's report is plagued by inaccuracies and opinions that are contradicted by fact. His claim that a single small arms projectile is capable of severing the upper body from the lower body or decapitation is so ridiculous that it should and actually does cast doubt on his qualifications as an expert in the field of firearms, particularly as it relates to wound ballistics. Additionally, there is an inconsistency in his opinion in that at one point, he states that stabilizing attributes are appropriate for self-defense, Why, in the next point he says that an attribute is inappropriate for self-defense because it is destabilizing. Now, circling back on the uh, 2 2 3 round that apparently is capable of cutting a human in half, something like out of Kill Bill Volumes 1 or 2 or something, um, this is how Mr. Boone responded. In almost 26 years of professional involvement in the field of wound ballistics, I have never heard, even anecdotally, of an incident wherein a person was decapitated or their upper body was severed from their lower body as a result of being shot by a single projectile fired from any small arm. It is notable that the 223556 is on the lower end of terminal performance potential of the vast calibers available in centerfire rifles. In fact, the 223556 is below the allowable minimum cartridges for deer hunting in some states. And that is actually true in Washington state. You cannot deer hunt with 223556. It is not a large enough caliber to do that, okay? And then Mr. Boone concludes with, Additionally, since reading Colonel Tucker's supplemental report, I have shared that statement with many of my associates in the firearm field. All have questioned the credentials of an expert that would make such a claim. It is my opinion that no examples have been provided because such performance has never been witnessed. So we will keep our eyes peeled on this case. Once again, the case is Rupp v. Bonta. And the state of California, if you're bringing, if this is your expert witness that you're bringing to court to try to save the day, um, well, we've gone well beyond a Hail Mary pass at this point. Listen, in the meantime, if there are any more developments, we will always let you know about this case. If you have any questions, however, about this case or anything else related to what's left, of your Second Amendment rights, you guys know what to do. You can always contact us at WashingtonGunLaw.com or you can call us directly at 425-765-0487. Now, in the meantime, let's remember, part of being the lawful and responsible gun owner, like we talk about all the time here at Washington Gun Law, is to know what the law is in every situation and how it applies to you in any instance that you may find yourself. Until next time, thanks for watching and stay safe.